Hey, Expanded Universe fans, it's time to geek out. And we here at Cinema Craptaculous couldn't do this without you, our awesome listeners. If you're not already subscribed to our Cinema Craptaculous channel, head on over to your favorite podcast platform and click that subscribe button. And while you're there, give us a rating and write us a review. Somebody here craves attention. I'm not saying who. Each week, we bring you a brand new show with awesome guests. Our shows include B-Sides, Terror Tunnel, Real Debates, Cinema Craptaculous, and, of course, The Expanded Universe, which is about to start now. Geek out! Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Cinema Craptaculous Presents The Expanded Universe. With your hosts, John H.H. H. Ford, Mario, Doc Diaz, and S'more. From movies to TV series to toys to comics to pop culture, this show is your safe space for all things geeky and where you can get your geek on. This is John H.H., H., and with me as always are my geek-tacular co-hosts. This is Doc. And S'more! Daniel Craig's license to kill or be killed is expiring as he hangs up his Walter PPK with his fifth and final James Bond film, No Time to Die, which has just opened. And we thought we at the Expanded Universe would geek out a bit on Daniel Craig's incredible 15-year tenure as Ian Production's sixth and certainly one of the most popular and solid actors to take on the role of Agent 007. So here we are, 2021. This film coming out was supposed to come out a year and a half ago. It's out, basically, for part of the world. Most of the world will be seeing it. But uh, let's go back to those early days of uh, Daniel Craig. Do you guys remember 2004? It was, was, you know, two years after Die Another Day. Oh, yeah. I can't believe you said 15 years. Well, Die Another Day came out in 2002, but... Uh, there was just some concern when they weren't really saying like, you know, Pierce's next film's coming out, you know. And then Pierce finally said, you know, I'm done. And it's like, what? What? And he basically said, eh, well, they didn't ask me back. Was there any good negotiation at all? Or You know, looking back, I think it was really just uh, after Die Another Day, which did pretty well for its time, didn't get the best reviews. And we all saw it together. We know why. He thought that, you know, a fifth one was, you know, like, we're going to do it. They couldn't top the CG wave, huh? Right. Yeah. Yeah. He was going to um, he was going to actually join the um, surfing competition in uh, in Hawaii uh, in this fifth outing. And no, basically, you know, we know what story the broccoli said, you know, the, the after September 11th and the Bourne franchise, they felt that it was time to really rethink the character. They had just got the rights to Casino Royale from the Ian Fleming estate, and they felt the time was right to, to do an origin story can't do an origin story with a guy that you've had four films with. Pierce, you know, there wasn't a contract signed, so they were under no obligation. Well, I do remember those days. And my first thought when, A, I heard that Pierce Brosnan was down the roll, and B, they announced Daniel Craig, my thought was, this franchise is done. Not only does this dude not look like James Bond, I never heard of this guy before. Daniel, who? What? You have like this blonde-haired Bond? What? What's going on? I just thought they lost their minds. I thought they didn't know what they were doing. I thought this franchise was done. So, like, well, this is the end of Bond. And then Casino Royale came out. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, think, I think it was at the time when they were, like, rebooting a bunch of stuff. You know, it's like a lot of studios were just cranking out movies, cranking out projects. And then, um, you know, when they announced that they were going to reboot it, it was just like, oh, great, another reboot. And, yeah, I was with you. You know, when they announced Daniel Craig, I was familiar with him. You know, he had done some other movies. Um, I can't remember the, uh, what was the uh, Spielberg movie that he did about the Olympics, the bombing? Munich. Munich. Yeah. You know, he was, oh, in, he was in, that? in that. Yeah. And yeah. he was in Layer Cake. So a lot of people point to Layer Cake was kind of like an audition for uh, the role as Bond. Yeah. Honestly, I've been a Bond fan since I was a kid. And most Bonds are like 6'2. But when they announced Daniel Craig, not only was he blonde, but he was 5'10. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, he's different stature compared to the other Bonds in the past that I was used to. One of our friends called him Elmer Fudd. That's messed up. Yeah. Well, and you know, it, it really was the early, uh, not the early days, but it was just before social media. So it was all website based. And there was that Craig Not Bond website by a bunch of teenagers. And then just, you know, the British tabloids and the American tabloids were just brutal. I don't know if they just kind of were ganging on the trolling that was already happening or they actually thought it was fun to bag on this guy. But I mean, they would surface just these horrible pics of him on set and talk about how things like he got sunburned or can't drive an Aston Martin, all these they really are ridiculous things. And and then there was that photo, I think it was a photo of him in the with shooting the scenes when he's in the ocean and we saw his physique. And then it was like, oh, oh geez, wow. Well it's, huh, it's a it's a different, different bond. 
Yeah, it's like this yeah. guy's, you know, got like a Hugh Jackman build, basically. And we're just like, whoa, physically, he's definitely in a different direction. He kind of looks like he could hurt someone. Um, and then that trailer came out for Casino Royale, and I was interested. I was really interested because, A, it was an origin story. Uh, they had Judy Dench, and that's when I started to soften, even though I still felt that Pierce Brosnan deserved a final outing if they were going to give him one. Um, and we'll talk about getting a final outing later, but talk about what you guys thought of Casino Royale when it came out. I was blown away because and growing up as a kid, yes, I love Bond. I love Roger Moore's Bond. I was aware of Sean Connery's Bond, although at that point as a kid, I didn't really watch any Sean Connery Bonds. But my mind was set. Bond looked like this tall, dark-haired, debonair, suave agent who wore tuxedos. And he had a sense of humor like Roger Moore. It really wasn't until... uh, Timothy Dalton? Timothy Dalton. I saw that. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. They're kind of mixing it up. That was a radical change for me because, because Timothy Dalton was like a rugged Bond and Stone Cold Killer and a little bit more serious. And back then I thought, okay, it's a little different, but uh, he still had that semblance of Bond in there that I recognized as a kid. When they announced Daniel Craig, I was pissed. It's like, this guy ain't Bond. He looks nothing like Bond. And then I watched Casino Royale and I came out as a bigger Bond fan. And all the changes that made they made for Casino Royale made sense to me. And I realized I judged him harshly. Yeah, kind of like what you were saying about uh, Timothy Dalton, you know, how he was a more rugged Bond and, uh, you know, rough around the edges. And uh, online, a lot of people have stated that he was kind of like kind of ahead of his time. You know, Daniel Craig is the more rugged Bond and people do did accept it when he came out. But Timothy Dalton, when he did it, people were still kind of like thinking Sean Connery, Roger Moore and uh, didn't really go for it. It's funny because they just did a recent poll in Bond fans and Timothy Dalton is polling as the favorite actor. I think part of that has to do with just sort of the timing, the age of like, you know, the Bond fans that are kind of like discovering Bond who are a little younger. They kind of want to do something a little novel. So, you know, I bet you you could go forward 10 years and Pierce Brosnan will, of course, be the favorite. Daniel Craig will be one maybe they're not as keen on. And you know what I mean? It's sort of like it kind of has to cycle out a little bit in time so that people can sort of get in there and find something cool and hip. But Dalton definitely did stuff that literally paved the way for both of them. Maybe there was weakness in the films, but back then it was just a different time. You know, the timing of those films. Everybody's watching Rambo and Lethal Weapon and uh, Schwarzenegger movies. And you know what I mean? And, and just Bond was finding a hard time in the late 80s. Did you say there was a poll and Timothy Dalton was number one? As, as yeah, I was best... just a, yeah, I just read it recently. Really? I've been following really? these little Bond groups. and He's a good actor, but um, yeah, he's, he's not my favorite Bond, but he's definitely a good actor. I think people kind of, you know, tend to go back and overanalyze just like they do with books. But, yeah. um, you know, Daniel Craig really overcame the trolling. Now, I don't know if social media was really in gear if he would have fared better or worse because there could have been more conversations. Well, I think that I think the trolling would have been a lot worse if social media were around when he was announced. But I think like most projects like this, people watch it and they'll go, oh, we were wrong. Let's post our support for this guy. But you're still going to have your special segment of a-holes who are going to deride him. He got the last laugh and so did the filmmakers because, you know, the producers, Barbara Broccoli and her stepbrother, Michael G. Wilson, had not selected their own Bond until then. They had sort of been a part of, you know, Pierce Brosnan was the last Bond that Cubby had selected. And then he passed away like right after, I think, Goldeneye. So this was really them striking out on their own and making choices. And I think Barbara really drove it. Public and the media are never right. Remember, it was all Clive Owen. Yeah. 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 Nobody banked on Daniel Craig. That's why when people talk about it, you know, in recent years, I don't put any stock into any of the predictions. They're never right. <laughs> you know, they definitely wanted a bond that reflected more of the times. And I think some of that was also like the Jason Bourne movies seriously had an impact. And and uh, and triple X. <laughs> oh, God. Triple X. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, they wanted agents that were more like rough and tumble and uh, you know dirty and who could blend in more to crowd in crowds and things like that. So I think that kind of led to Daniel Craig. They also were kind of showing an open disdain for the formula, you know. So like Daniel Craig, when he's order did, did not order his martini shaken, not stirred. He didn't give a damn, you know. They were they did not have the gadgets. Wait, he didn't quite have the womanizing demeanor. If he had, if he you know in the first one he, he beds a woman, but. He leaves before anything happens because he goes on the mission. He really seemed more focused on his mission. And Vesper was a real love interest for the first time in, well, probably since Under Majesty's Secret Service. 
Hey, really quick, uh, you mentioned uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service. I just wanted to say George Lazenby really quick, because I don't think at any other time in this podcast are we going to say his name. So I just wanted to say <laughs> that. Shout out to George Lazenby. Shout George out Lazenby. to George Lazenby. This never happened to the other fella. So we get to 2008, and and right before they finished, you know, Casino Royale, they were already prepping. It was kind of like the old days of Bond, where they would like overlap. Because don't forget, back in like the Sean Connery era, they would do one every year. Yeah, back to back. And to even back. in the ro- early days yeah. of Roger Moore, it was like two years. So mm-hmm. you know, they kind of wanted to get back to that with Quantum of Solace, which was a uh, we learned was a direct follow up to the events of Casino Royale. But then there was a writer's strike, and there was also talk of a possible actor's strike. But the writer's strike really hamstrung that movie and they is that why quantum of solace sucked <laughs> yeah i said it. it's 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 not his best outing it sucked i'm sorry that was the weakest bond he he literally said like recently he said like you know, i'm not a writer and i'm like what so basically you guys would show up on set and have to make it up so there were scenes where they had to do that because the script wasn't finished and they so yeah it shows but i think ultimately the film is still decent enough because it does sort of further what we know to be a connective storyline Quantum yeah. of Solace, they hadn't quite gotten into the tropes yet. It was still just M, and I think we had Tanner, which was, you know, which yeah. is Rory, what's his name, from uh, Any Dreadful, who we like. But really, they they were still staying away from going into the familiar. And I don't know what their reasoning was to staying away from bringing in Money Penny, bringing in Q oh. and the gadgets. But you know what? There was nothing, nothing good about that movie then. Stop. Oh, here we go. <laughs> you didn't even like the theme song? Alicia Keys and Jack. It's kind of like you were saying, Ford. I think they were kind of trying to stay away for, from like the tropes and like the staples of the uh, the franchise. And I think when they got to Skyfall, they're kind of like, you know what? We can do a little bit more of that. And so they started including those elements. 007, I'm your new quartermaster. You must be joking. Why? Because I'm not wearing a lab coat? Because you still have spots. My complexion is hardly relevant. And your competence is... Age is no guarantee of efficiency. And youth is no guarantee of innovation. Or has it I can do more damage on my laptop sitting in my pajamas before my first cup of Earl Grey than you can do in a year in the field? So why do you need me? Every now and then a trigger has to be pulled. Or not pulled. It's hard to know which in your pajamas. Skyfall became like the most successful Bond film ever. I mean, or at least in recent times, you know. Made a billion dollars. Yeah, just overall, it was just so cool. It's so cliche to say this. It's not the perfect film, but it just looked cool from like every angle, every element, the way he acted, things that he did. Yeah, so I just like going back to watch it because it's it's fun to watch. It's a great movie. Well, I think they had the the perfect near perfect balance of classic Bond that we like. They start to slowly introduce the gadgets. They had the cool over the top villain with Raul Silva. And then, but at the same time, there was still an element of realism in it. You're getting to know yeah. who Bond is, and his relationship with M, which for me was the best part of the movie. You have this, you know, almost motherly relationship that M had with with Bond, and they explored that. I think it worked she, well. She really was the Bond girl in that movie. She was. And honestly, I think it it did sort of dovetail a bit of the Brosnan era because, you know, there was the weird choice to keep Judi Dench even though they were rebooting, which they did in the old days where they would bring in Roger Moore and still have the same Q&M and they bring in, you know, the Q was the, what he had four Bond actors. He was still Q up until the Brosnan era. Well, let me ask you guys this. Do you think that's distracting when they have, they quote unquote, reboot a franchise Yet they still keep certain elements or certain characters the same. Same actors, same idea. For me, I think it just depends on the actor. Uh, if the actor is great uh, or like beloved, then I'm willing to like let it go. Okay. Uh, but in some other cases where I'm kind of like, it is distracting in other cases when the actor is, I don't want to say mediocre, but just not as, you know, it doesn't, sh- doesn't stand out as much. I think it was a weird convention that they started. And, and honestly, the the producers were brilliant back in the day. By starting out of the gate, we're going to just recast the lead actor. Mm-hmm. And these other franchises, other franchises like super, superheroes and French asses. Uh, you know, like French asses. Indiana, Indiana Jones is another example where it's like, no, it, they tied it too much to the actors. Um, and I think that with the Bond uh, production, they were really smart to kind of say, nope, it's a character, it's a literary character. Sean Connery was terrific, but we're not going to let one actor's take on it. You know, it, part of it's greed. You know, a lot of people were like, well, no Sean Connery. And I think Lazenby, if he had done one more, sorry, I said his name. 
If he had done one more, <laughs> I think be. people people might have had a little more respect for him, even though the film gets a lot of respect. I like that movie. Well, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, uh, John, mega James Bond fan. So the Craig Bonds, they are connected to the other Bonds. Is it the same continuity? Is it not the same continuity? Because they have elements from earlier Bonds that's in this new Bond. But we're, we're supposed to take this as a different bond. I mean, is it all connected? No, it's a different continuity. What they're just trying to do is bring in uh, characters and tropes and elements that, re- that that pay homage to the old films. But it is a total new continuity. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's a good segue because, you know, when you get to Skyfall's ending, they basically – that's the moment that he becomes – that the Bond world we know, that firmament is now in place. The very end where he walks into Mallory's office and he says – so, 007, lots to be done. Are you ready to get back to work? With pleasure, M. With pleasure. And Money Penny's there, and you've got the padded door, you know, and the. Right. So that's like now we're, we're basically brought up to the world of mm-hmm. the Roger Moore era or the Connery era. But the difference is. Um, as we get into the next film, Spectre, because they had the, <laughs> they finally had the rights to use Blofeld and Spectre, <sighs> which had been part part had been tangled up in, in legal drama for decades because of a guy named Kevin McClory who co-wrote Thunderball, the novel with Ian Fleming, and that's why we got 1983's Never Seen Ever Again with Sean Connery, and, and they were going to remake that in 2000 with Timothy Dalton, and they were going to, I mean. And then when they finally, that guy died <laughs> and the estate just <laughs> oh, said, man. here, and they finally just Let's said, just take wait. it, we don't. <laughs> so they finally had everything. They had Spectre and Blofeld. They said, okay, let's do that. But they wanted to find a way to connect it to the previous films, which yeah. when we saw Quantum of Solace, I'm like, wait a minute, there's this group Quantum, which is this sinister organization embedded in everywhere. Couldn't that just be Spectre? Well, we waited and yeah, basically that's what they did. Well, okay. Can, can I rant for for a minute? Let me rant. Blowfield is my favorite film, favorite villain in the Bond franchise, and I love Spectre, especially as a kid. You know, they're an evil organization. They want to take over the world. Blowfield is a supervillain, right? I watch Spectre. I acknowledge that Spectre has all kinds of problems, including what they've done with Blowfield, which I didn't quite like. But I'm torn because there's a lot of stuff about Spectre I did like. The very fact that they brought in Spectre and called it Spectre and connected Quantum to Spectre, which I get why they did it. I actually like that they did that because it should have been Spectre all along. But I'm torn. It's like this movie has problems and I want to like it and I do like it. And I'm wondering if I'm just biased and deluding myself. Is Spectre a good film? My opinion? It's not. <laughs> uh, has a great intro. Uh, I also wanted it to be really, really good because when they finally announced it and it was called Spectre, I've yeah. been waiting for that for a long time. I wanted to see Blofeld. But yeah, the movie has a lot of problems. Uh, they had kind of already gotten us used to toning down like the gadgets uh, in the previous movies, uh, previous Daniel Craig movies. And so it seems like with this movie, they kind of threw in some, well... Some, some cheesier elements, some cheesier gadgets, right? kind of like hailing back to, you know, the, uh, the older films. And I kind of wish they would have left that stuff out. And then of course the, the whole twist connection thing between Bond and Blofeld. Oh Blofeld. God, I hate that. Yeah. I, I just don't that. like it when they go out of their way to make, try to make these connections between characters. And I'm like, you don't need those connections. They don't have to be related. They don't have to have a past together, you know? So that, that just, it bugged me. Spoilers, people. Blofeld is James Bond's Bond stepbrother. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> One million dollars. Oh, wait a yeah, minute. No. Mr. Powers, <laughs> my name is Doug Eva. <laughs> I'm your brother. I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, it was a bit of a letdown. You know, as a, as a big Bond fan, we tend to forgive it much like we defend, you know, people who like me, artists, you know, usually like, it was a mediocre album, but I'm still a fan. Um, I kind of feel that way with Spectre. I, I sort of choose to find the positives in it because on yes. repeat viewings, I can do that. But I think Doc hit it out of the park with that comment. It is wholly unnecessary to have connected uh, Blofeld and Bond in that way. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that they probably looked at said, yeah, we got Spectre. 
oh shit, we've got Spectre. Spectre is <laughs> such a it's such a product of the, the 1960s. It's cheesy. You know, cheesy spy there's but this organization okay. and the organization and and you know austin powers just totally ruined it forever and blow ruined ruined blofeld it's cheesy <laughs> but you have to acknowledge that certain aspects of james bond no matter how much you reboot it is kind of cheesy too it's just james bond we accept that here's what i wish they've done with specter instead of making him you know his evil stepbrother who built an organization to destroy him just make Spectre an evil corporation. Greedy people make Blofeld a CEO who happens to want to control everything on the planet. Boom, there you go. They don't need to be connected. Why, why does he have to be a stepbrother? That's not necessary. Keeping this in, in tone with the conversation of the Daniel Craig era, I think one of the struggles they had was they 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 always wanted to make things real grounded with a focus on humanity. And I think that does run contrary when they try to bring in the tropes and the things about the Bond franchise that people enjoy, which is those cheesy, totally uh, unbelievable aspects, certainly yes. espion espionage, yes. but also even technology. And I think with Spectre, they were really trying to thread a needle by trying – they are trying to walk both sides. Like, let's give Bond fans – the elements we from the old days, the Daniel Craig era is realistic and it's got to have emotion. And they brought in, you know, like a real relationship that harkens back to John, Jasper a little Don, bit. Meaning, don't don't you guys agree though that a, a good writer, given those parameters, could have made that work? I think so. Yeah, you could bring Inspector and just uh, leave out the cheesier elements. Uh, Silva. Not that he was a believable Bond villain, but just when he talked about like, there's just a couple of computer servers and this is what we do. I mean, that's that's really the scary terrorism that really out there is just hacking and cyber terror. And they're never going to go to real terror, which is, you know, like Bombings, suicide bombers suicide bomber, and stuff yeah. like that. They're, they're just not going to go there. But, you know, honestly, you know, real intelligence gathering is a little closer to what they do on Jack Ryan in the office where a bunch of people with computers just going through – subpoenaing uh but people's that's, that's boring cell phone data hacking <laughs> that's boring to watch give me your over the top not goofy but over the top villainous mastermind plotting world domination except he's using high better tech well it brings us to 2020 or 2021 what do we expect from no time to die well i think that again just since again taking the pandemic off the table because this film was in the can for the pandemic like literally done, I think there's probably, you know, a big influence of the Me Too movement. So I think we're going to have a stronger female perspective, which, you know, they brought in Phoebe Waller-Bridge to work on the script. And I'm assuming because they wanted, you know, not just her voice because her star was on the rise, but they specifically wanted a female voice. Hey there, we'll be right back. Hey, this is Dave. We recognize that systematic racism exists, and one of the best ways to overcome it is by amplifying the voices that need to be heard. To continue that mission, every month we'll share a podcast or charity to support. This month, we're supporting the Black Fairy Godmother Foundation, whose mission is to restore black and brown families' stability by removing the barriers that keep them in abject poverty and domestic violence situations. You can find more information and donate at blackfairygodmother.org. And now, back to the show. Now, I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Lisa Funnel, who was uh, our guest last year to talk about Bond. She's an associate professor at the University of Oklahoma uh, in gender and women's studies, and she's a Bond scholar. She teaches a course on James Bond movies and has written a couple books. And in our interview, we talk a bit about, you know, the women writers in the Bond franchise, because Phoebe was not the first. She's mm. the only one who got credited. Really? Oh, damn, so, uh, really? Let's, I yeah, know well, why, well, why don't we take a listen to, uh, you know, a bit of my interview with Dr. Lisa Funnel. Thank you so much for inviting me back. Now, the writing on this film is, is unique to a lot of the other Bond films. And we know that writing any screenplay tends to go through many hands, and the Bond franchise is no different. For, you know, this film, Danny Boyle had his own team on the first iteration before bowing out on the project and creative dis differences. And um, you were recently interviewed in, was it a BBC article where Beth mm -hmm. Webb talks with you about Phoebe Waller-Bridge's participation on the script for No Time to Die. And while everyone seems pleased that Waller-Bridge's contributions will be felt in the Bond franchise, you mention an overriding complaint that it took nearly six decades to have only the second female Bond writer credited, the first being uh, Joanna Harwood for 1962's Dr. No!, and she was also hired, I think, on From Russia with Love, but had a falling mm -hmm. out with the director. Yes. 
Now, Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson were just interviewed, uh, I think it was on BB4, and they responded to her being brought on, and they said that she made a major contribution, and Wilson added that uh, she gave us an interesting point of view for several of the characters. It's unfair to think of her as a female writer. She contributed to the whole plot of the film. Now, my question for you, and I think it's something that uh, you may have already commented on, but you brought up an interesting point. Why was Phoebe Waller-Bridge brought in later in the process and not in the beginning? Yeah. And, and to, to go back to the comment about her being a female writer, as and I think his phrasing is not just speaking about her assigned sex at birth, but the fact that she was brought in to write for the women in the film. I think it's really important that we understand that script writers are writing characters who are like them and who are different from them. And this idea of bringing in diversity, so bringing in women, bringing in writers from um, historically underrepresented racial minority groups, bringing them in to spot shot a script that is already done, to me, is not true diversity. To me, when we think about script writing, we're talking about conceptualizing the world of Bond. I want to have a variety of voices from the outset, from the conceptualization of the plot, uh, the storyline, who the villains are, characterization, character development. And I think it's important to be part of that entire process rather than being brought in at the end to spot shot or fix or add, say, diversity after the fact, and this is not the only film where this is, has happened. I've, I've definitely criticized um, Hollywood for for doing this um, and, and even U.S. television for doing this after the fact, like we need to fix this. So then we're going to bring in other people without realizing that maybe having the perspective of Phoebe Waller-Bridge telling the story of ver a variety of characters would be incredibly useful just as when we think about action women in Hollywood most of these women are written, directed, and produced by men. You know, men have been writing women characters for a long time. Women can write men characters. And when you look at Phoebe Waller-Bridge, first of all, this woman understands genre. Watch Killing Eve and tell me she doesn't understand the spy genre. Yeah. Secondly, this woman is incredibly witty. She is smart and quick-witted. And that is something that has always defined the world of James Bond. And lastly, this woman understands timing. Watch her in any interview that she has ever been on and tell me you don't laugh. She just has that comedic timing. And you put all those things together and I'm sitting here being like, this woman needs to write a Bond film. So if this is her trial run, rock on, but let's bring her on to Bond 26 because I want to see what she can bring when she's there from the outset. Well, I don't think we ever get a full picture of the, the I don't want to say drama, but the process behind the scenes because, you know, mm -hmm. this film had you know, another whole, whole other director. I mean, you know, what they, when they talk about the budget, are they, I don't think they're factoring in what was sunk into Danny Boyle's iteration. And for whatever reason, you know, they had to, you know, start over from scratch. And that's, that's happened on other things. I don't know sure. if it's happened on a Bond film in my lifetime where they had a director who wrote a film or was working on it. And then, you know, it, it was jettisoned, but it's interesting. They had an opportunity to bring her in at the beginning. Now we don't know what went on really. I don't know. I mean, perhaps, they needed a script doctor, and they're just they're people like the late Carrie Fisher, who she was hired because she was Carrie Fisher. I don't think I don't believe in interviews she was brought in to write scripts necessarily for female points of view, but that could you know I'd get some drinks into Carrie back in the day. I'm sure she would tell you all sorts of things. <laughs> but you know, traditionally it was a boys' game. You know, Tarantino was a, was a script polisher, a lot of others. But it's interesting because Waller Bridge was just coming off a of flea bag, so. You also wonder if there's a little bit of, I don't want to say flavor of the month, but more of like she's in the zeitgeist and we know she mm -hmm. can write and she's British. So it's hard to tell where she fits in, but by all measures, it feels like she was brought in to bring in those viewpoints. And it also is an indictment on the franchise that you have to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think you, I mean, you bring in, we don't really talk about what happens behind the scenes in films. So let's, let's be honest. There is little diversity when it comes to who creates the film. We look at a film and we're like, ooh, diversity. But I want to know who are in the major creative roles behind the scenes. And women, for instance, make up 
we'll just average it at 10% of directors, cinematographers, composers, it's way down low, uh, script writers, editors, right? When you talk about the major creative roles, women are not occupying those positions. And then, you know, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is a really good example of the way that social networking and 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 and, and sort of the, the capital that you build by being in the, these networks contributes to your involvement on specific films. So you work with the people that you know, you work with the people who um, can actually actualize your creative vision. You work with people who are like, this person's really cool. We should bring them on. I mean, those are the types of conversations that happen and opportunities stem from them. But it just seems historically like it's been a very select group of people who are given those opportunities rather yeah. than others. And the one thing I would really push for, if I'm, if, I mean, if we're going to talk about diversity in, in a Bond film, I actually want to see more than just a woman as a scriptwriter. Yeah. I want to see if there's a commitment by producers, they've, they've, they've talked about it. And specifically Barbara Broccoli has talked about, you know, being an advocate for women filmmakers, then maybe bringing in women in more creative roles in this film would benefit the film. Um, so this idea that only men can create a, a figure like James Bond, I think has contributed to the marginalization of women in creative roles. And it's also contributed to the fact why we have not remembered, you know, Joanna Harwood for her contributions. Yeah. When you're talking about these personalized narratives, you know, that each man is giving, you know, the director is giving this personal uh, um, uh, contribution and, and you know, this particular script writer and they're framing it in, in terms of themselves, but they're not necessarily giving us the whole complete entire picture. So we're only going sometimes by the subjective um, contributions and the storytelling. And let's be honest, when we tell stories, we tell stories from the benefit of ourselves, right? We're going to look good. So like when we talk about truth, it's like one person's perspective, another person's perspective, but then there's the middle ground of what actually happened. And so we've just been creating this narrative or this, this myth. Um, and, and I think that there's just other stories that need to be told. And I will say this, um, there are a, an amazing group of scholars working specifically in the UK, um, working on this sort of reclamation work about different figures in the world of James Bond. I know that there's a book project eventually that will come out, and I'm sure there's lots of good stuff in there, but there is work being done in order to just give, give it, expand this narrative, right? And make it more yeah. reflective of the people who've been operating in the space. So that was some pretty enlightening stuff from Dr. Lisa Funnel. And for those of you out there who want to hear more Bond talk from my interview with Dr. Funnel, we're going to have like a bonus episode, hopefully. I think the biggest thing about Daniel Craig's era, and I think a lot of it has to do with Daniel Craig himself and the choices he wanted to make, as he got more creative control uh, as the films went on, is he wanted to really make sure that it was, it was accessible to all audiences. Because I know a lot of people saw the earlier films, but, you know, Bond really does just exude this white British privilege in all those earlier films <laughs> where the other, other, pe the other people in other countries are just contacts there to service his mission. And the locals just kind of kind of kowtow to his white Britishness. So, J John, are you saying that we need a Bond who, say, is not white or male? Is that what you're saying? It's just a different world even since Spectre came out going into No Time to Die. There's been a lot more conversations on race and gender. I, I know I've talked to various people from all backgrounds. And, you know, one friend of mine, he's black Cuban. He said, uh, I don't mind Bond being a white British guy. I don't feel I need to have that. Uh, if they want to create a really cool character for a, a black man, then make that character. But I don't feel it. That's just his point of view. I agree with him 150%. I do. Because my biggest pet peeve that's going on now is that, yes, we do need diversity. And we do need to hear all points of view. But a lot of producers feel the need to take an existing property or an existing brand or existing character and invert it, make it black, make it female. And I say, A, you need to be more creative than that. If you want to have more representation in Hollywood and in entertainment, create these characters, create these new characters. I would rather have a new character than someone else's hand-me-down. And I'm going to call them hand-me-downs. I don't want, I don't want a black Bond. And here's why. Bond was a, was a white guy, a white British guy. Create another black super spy. Create a character that we can own, that's uniquely ours, that isn't based on the hand-me-downs or the leftover clothing of other characters. I don't want that. I think it's stronger to do this. I think it, it sends a better message as opposed to, okay, we know that you guys like this, but we're just going to change it just a little bit so that we can get more of an audience. Because that's what that says to me. You know, that's pandering. And I do not like pandering with stuff like this. Keep Bond white. 
I know it sounds weird, but that's who the character is. Give me my own super spy. Give me my own characters and make legends out of them. Doc, what do you think? I agree. Yeah, you know, it's what Sean, going off what Sean was saying about uh, creating new characters, you know, years back they created Luther with uh, Idris Elba. I love that series. You know, uh, every once, you know, a while back they released like a fourth season and there's plans to release a movie. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's the route that they should take. They should create new characters, get good writers. And um, yeah, like Sean said, don't uh, don't give us the hand me downs. I think there's a way to also, you know, allow these characters to interact with other characters to, you know, and I think if we're talking about like the upcoming film, they're just from for people who have been paying attention to the trailers, they seem to be trying to to do just that. Again, these spy films are not representative of real espionage. They brought some consultants to the set of the more recent films, but you know, they're they're still it's still fantasy. And the Bond character, this guy that will go around this one man army, you know, makes no sense. But that's okay. That's okay. It doesn't necessarily have to be completely 100% real because A, I don't know what real espionage is. My guess is as some dude who probably looks like he can be any race, going to any country, sitting down, gathering intel in the most boring way possible so he doesn't get killed. I don't want to see a two-hour movie about that. I want to see a dude who can jump off a building with a parachute that magically appears out of his backpack and gun down six criminals at the same time. It's fantasy. I'm okay with that. People also wanted to see you know, the sex and the yes. lifestyle. And I yes. think that's something that's problematic. And, Dan, and and I think it's in the Daniel Craig era. They've tried to try to figure that out. That, you know, obviously just going around betting women who fall for you or, or fall to your forcefully advances. You know, it, Dr. Funnel was saying when she teaches her courses, they show the early ones and it's abhorrent to them. They call Sean Connery's bond the rapey bond. <laughs> Well, it's and true. if you go back to watch some of those films, there's a lot of problematic scenes. Now, I can look at those films and go, you know what? That was the 1960s. You know, I'm not saying it's right. It just means that I can take put my hat of, yes, people didn't behave and think like they do right now. And we have to understand that. And I think that applies to a lot of things. Um, but I think Daniel Craig's Bond, I think what he was trying to do is make this guy a real guy. So right. if he kills someone, he, he feels the kill. Mm -hmm. If he is romantically involved with someone there is something behind it more than just oh, i'm trying to get information you know right i think there's a good thing but it, you're you're constantly pulling away from the expectations that people want from the character and i think that's just their biggest challenge is we want to make the character relevant so we can go another how many years but some of the things that people like literally are becoming antiquated okay i see that uh and i agree with that to a certain extent you know, you have a character, you want to update the character for the modern world. But at the same time, part of the element of movie going and watching a property and being entertained is that little element of fantasy that, well, these people who are of their right mind understand that it's fantasy. This isn't real. Yes, James Bond should not be a rapist. And Sean Connery's Bond is kind of the rapey Bond. I agree with that. But at the same time, I do like the fact that this dude is so suave that he gets a lot of ladies. You can still write in such a way where he's not a rapist. You can write in such a way where he's just that damn charming. And yeah, that's not exactly realistic, but that's okay. Because I'm not paying my 20 bucks to go to a movie theater to watch The Adventures of Realistic James Bond. Because that's boring. Give me the fantasy. <laughs> Secret agent at a computer. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I think the biggest thing is to just give women station. You know, give yes. them fleshed out characters. And I think they've tried to do that. They were doing that in the Brosnan era. You know, if you, if you look at, I mean, not all the characters were as Christmas you know, Jones? well written. Nah, but, but you know what? She was a <laughs> nuclear scientist. Uh, but you know, sure. you know, with Jinx and with Michelle, <laughs> with Michelle Yeoh's Y Lin, you know, those were kick-ass characters. They were going to give Halle Berry her own spinoff. I remember yeah, that. Jinx. Yeah, that's right. Right. And, and Y Lin is still very popular. A lot of people love Michelle Yeoh and that is a film that people love because she is toe to toe with Brosnan, and oh, they yeah, still she, do she's that one now. of my favorites. They were trying, and I, I think that that's really the key: is you don't have to marginalize Bond, just bring other people up. Yeah, well, this new Double O, this new female black Double O, if she's interesting enough, do a series with her. Doesn't have to be James Bond; she could be whatever her name is, Double O Sister. 
I know. Guys. Well, that, but that's the question that people are having. And obviously, once everybody has seen No Time to Die, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of discussions will be had about the future of the franchise. I think, you know, well, I've talked about this and. In the next iteration, I don't think they should try to... The, Daniel Craig and the era is going to be a tough act to follow. It's also going to just be tough to follow because they chose sort of this romantic course. You know, they brought back the girlfriend and they made him, you know, more human. I think in the next one, you can still do that. But I would have him, the next Bond, I would get a new actor. Mm-hmm. I would change the continuity. Don't do an origin. I would mm-hmm. have him yeah. in his in his 30s, make him young, yes. but he's already a double O, mm-hmm. and, I, and he needs to be embedded. He, I, I, I use the night manager or even license to kill as a template where he goes deep undercover, maybe a little too undercover, and that becomes a problem. Maybe he gets a little too into the lifestyle. Ah, uh, the Donnie he, Brasco they, bond. Right. I mean, because I think, <laughs> I think he, should be, he shouldn't just be the bull in the china shop. Who is just out there in this, you know, making drawing all this attention? With <laughs> you can still have action sequences. I think he needs to be in with the bad guys. Now, with this new, with this new John reboot, would Bond still be British? Would he still be white? Would he still be a male? I I think he should still be British. I think that it is. It's like Sherlock Holmes is a British character. So I, you know, even though you know people forget that that they did consider American actors, James Brolin, Burt Reynolds. John Gavin, these were American actors back in the when Sean Connery wasn't going to come back. But I think it's 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 not like Hamlet where you could say, yes, he's Danish. But, you know, we're going to set it in contemporary New York with Ethan Hawke. I think Bond needs to be British, (laughs) you know, which they did. Yeah, they did. I I prefer prefer Hamlet with Ethan Hawke. But I think that the character, it is British. Uh, (laughs) As for his ethnicity, you know, there's a lot of British people, as I now know, who are not white. I would not want to see is the producers feeling they're going to be damned if they do, damned if they don't. They're in a tough yeah. position now because race and gender and gen and, and identity is such a focus now that you can't just say we found the right actor. You're going to take heat based on your choice. You're going to take heat if you cast a black actor. You're going to take heat if you don't. I think ultimately they should look at a range of actors and if they do go with, for someone who isn't white, decide if that's going to be an issue, meaning like, does he infiltrate a place where his ethnicity helps or hurts him? Because they've never really dealt with that. At the beginning of Casino mm-hmm. Royale, Bond is in like... Uh, oh, he's somewhere in Africa. Like yeah, in Africa. and I'm like, yeah. like, well, what the hell? And and his fellow agent is also a white dude. I'm like, why would they send those guys in to that little... <laughs> it was 2006. But Doug, what do you think? Reboot it, Bond. How would you do go about it similar approach to what they did with daniel craig you know growing up watching all the older films it was all continuous when they rebooted with craig at first i was i was against it because i was used to just him being the same character hopping from mission to mission uh i grew to like daniel craig's reboot and these five movies being self-contained so i would reboot it again self-contained and then kind of like what Ford was saying, I'd stay away from an origin because one issue that I had with Daniel Craig's run is that uh, Casino Royale was like him like right before he, or as he was becoming Bond. And then by like his third film, he was already saying he was too old for this. You know, I'm he was too like, old for this I'm shit. too old for this already. And then like the last three films, he was already saying that or he was like retired, out of retirement, retired, out of retirement. And I was like, that seemed kind of accelerated for me. And I understand, you know, in you know, the real world, real time, actors all of us get old i understand that so i would jump in reboot it start at a point where this you know the new bond is already james bond and then hop into missions they could do another contained story arc again i'm totally cool with that like moving moving forward if they did that i'd be okay with it and so now the audience is kind of used to having a new story arc per new actor damn it i'm not old i'm vintage vintage remember that vintage Vintage. Yeah. You guys want me to like run through a list of? I'm sure we've all seen articles with like different actors who people have said are possible. Yes. Bond. Bonds. Yes. You guys want me to go through with a list? the caveat that that I think all of them will be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. course. You know, it's like <laughs> over the years we've been seeing these since like probably Quantum of Solace. You know, they've had lists of actors who people speculate will be the next Bond. This article here is. <clears throat> A pretty recent article, but like um, like Ford is saying, uh, this is a really good chance that none of these actors will be Bond. All right. Uh, of course, a uh, name that always comes at the, at the top of the list is Tom Hardy. Nope. <laughs> um, yeah, he's already Venom. So I, I like the actor, but I'm not really sure I want him as Bond. Although Unless he sounds like this, I'm James Bond. <laughs> That's yes. right. Yeah. He's Bane. Uh, he's Bane. James Bane. Bane. Yeah, James, James Bane. Bane. Reggae Jean Page. 
from uh, Bridgerton. He's also on the list. He's mm. uh, a newer addition to this, this type of list. Uh, Luke Evans. I've seen no. him pop up. Pop up Dracula? A few times. He played yeah. Dracula, right? No. Yeah, no. he was. And he was uh, Gaston. <laughs> Live oh, action God. Beauty and the Beast. James Norton. I'm not too familiar with James Norton. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are. The talk show host? No, no. That's no. <laughs> Graham Norton. That's Graham. Oh, Graham, yes. Graham. Yeah, okay, I would sorry. like to see that. Yes. No, he would love that. No, I think that would totally open up a new audience. Dude, <laughs> I could totally see him uh, opening up an episode with the gun barrel of him walking out. <laughs> Well, he, uh, he would hold his he would hold his drink as he's carrying the gun too. Uh, another <laughs> actor that keeps coming up is Tom Hiddleston. You know what? He could do it. I've already seen him in the Night Manager, and to me, I'll keep thinking that. I mean, he's good. I think, I think it was almost like the, the the Night Manager made you think this could be James Bond. He could yeah. be James Bond, but the Night Manager was so perfect. It was almost like that's that was his James Bond. That was his Bond. That was his that was his outing. I like him as Night Manager, and I liked him as, I like him as Loki, and that's that's good enough for me. Yeah. But he uh, could surprise us. He could. Totally. Next on the list is Michael Fassbender. X-Men First Class. I like him. He did a yeah. great Bond take in X-Men First Class. I, I think maybe he might be a little too old. For what I think a lot of these guys, except for Paige from Bridgerton, are too old. Because by the time they make the decision, let's just say it's the end of 2022. Idris Elba will be, what, 50? Or 50, yeah. about 40 so yeah. you know and, and he he would have been honestly if they were going to go down that route he was the guy physically he was, he was. a great actor um and uh, then how, I, but i think was, uh, Roger Moore when he started 80 85 <laughs> <laughs> he was 79 and um no uh he was 43 the oldest actor to to start the role was either Roger Moore or Pierce Brosnan. I don't know. But but my point is, is that, you know, because it takes so long now between films, it's not like the old days where they did one after the other. They need a yeah. guy in his 30s. Honestly, I, I worry with Amazon and the pressure to appeal to demographics that they're going to, let's do Teenage Bond or The College Years. And oh, James Bond you know what would be perfect? You know what would be perfect for James Bond Jr.? Tom Holland. <laughs> <laughs> He's young. He's I literally British. saw a tweet today with him in it, you know, and what is he, five foot seven or whatever? He'd be, oh, he's you know, a guy, yeah. but he's, he could do some serious acrobatics as Bond. He could. Backflip Bond. Uh, another young James Bond. Seems like uh, Hollywood loves casting uh, Timothy Chalamet. He's in everything. He, he's he's going to be young in everything. Guy. But he's uh, not British. He's American. Yeah. They can fake the accent. Sorry, Brits. Uh, so real quick, uh, I'll just go down the rest of the uh, few other people. Uh, Richard Madden, you know, from Game of Thrones and going to be in The Eternals. Uh, someone Ford mentioned earlier, uh, Lashana Lynch, who's in No Time to Die, Cillian Murphy, uh, Idris Elba, we mentioned him. And then, of course, there's uh, Henry Cavill. What about the guy, what's his name, the Scottish actor from Outlander? I've, I've heard him mentioned. Hugh uh, something or what? see, is it uh, Sam? Yes, yeah, Sam Hugh. I can't pronounce yeah. the last name. I'm sorry. Yes. He's Hugh, Scottish. Hugh, Hewin? Hewin? Sam Hewin? Yeah, he's yeah. fit fit. Um, I mean, you know, it depends. It just depends on what they want. Again, do they want someone physically that just sort of is appealing? Like, you know, and we all know what film appealing is. I think people need to stop saying like, well, it's not fair that we just ju look. There was a reason certain actors get cast certain roles. I'm not saying they have to look like a soap star, but film stars are tend to be what we call attractive. And if they weren't, why did every actor in the Marvel Universe work so hard to have an amazing physique if it doesn't matter? And again, people, we're talking about elements of fantasy in here. It doesn't have to be completely 100% real. That's not why we go to movies. I don't need that much realism in my movies. Part of me going to the movies is a bit of escapism. I do like to indulge in the fantasy. I do want to see this fantastical world of gadgets and spies and cool as hell agents, you know, good looking dudes and tuxes fighting crime against mega maniacal supervillains. There's nothing wrong with that, guys. Just let's not make it 100% over the top real. <laughs> well, and Daniel Craig could be argued was, was, you know, I mean, Pierce Brosnan was like, you know, basically a male model. Daniel Craig, other than his incredible physique, uh, that was not a, sort of a standard handsome man. He was a kind be of a very, craggy, very quiet. Yeah, very uh -huh. kind of a craggy looking dude. Craggy, <laughs> craggy. And I think that's what I loved about Daniel, Daniel Craig. Craig is people, some people thought he looked too old right when he was playing it. And I'm like, no, that's great. He, he's, he should look a little weathered like a guy that's been out there and. Craig's Bond looked like a dude who could kill you. Who could so survive from, a fight uh, with several guys. Yeah. So guys from the uh, from that list, do you guys have anyone uh, a favorite from that list or anyone who's not on the list who you guys would prefer? 
or is it too soon? Yeah, you guys mentioned it earlier. Idris Elba would have been great for the role, but I think he's a little too old now. Uh, this Sam Hewen guy looks like Bond to me. He really does. I see why people are talking about him. He looks like he could be a good Bond, like a good cross between Daniel Craig and Pierce Brosnan. I, I saw I seen him on Outlander. He's a good actor. He I mean he was pretty young on Outlander when it started, so he's matured a bit. There is a maturity that I think you have to decide: Do you want someone doe eyed or do you want someone mature? And even though Craig was a younger actor and a younger Bond, he still was like mature enough to look like you know he you know, he can handle himself. Um, I, I agree with Sean. Elbow would have been great. Um, the guy from Bridgerton, um, you know he's he's good. And he's, you know, the ladies love him, but there's a little bit of just like, he's on the list because he was flavor of the month. And I think some of those other people. Yeah. Yeah. He's a real new addition to the list. He was in the zeitgeist. And I think that's always where people go wrong with casting. Clive Owen kept popping up and he wasn't like just, you know, everybody, he wasn't everywhere, but people just kind of kept bringing him up. He did those BMW ads back in the early 2000s. Later, he said, particularly after Daniel Craig was firmly in the role, he said, guys, nobody ever approached me. Wow. Never auditioned. For me, if I had to pick someone off the list, I'd probably go with Henry Cavill. Honestly, I feel like he was kind of screwed in the role of Superman. Really didn't you know, reach his full potential. I right. loved him in The Man the Man from U.N.C.L.E. I love that movie. Which we uh, know there will not be a sequel to. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm so bummed out that we'll never get to see a follow-up to The Man from U.N.C.L.E. So because of that, I'm like, give him James Bond. I don't think it'll happen. But if he did, if he showed up in the role, I'd be cool with it. Hold this, Cavill? I think it's like 38. Well, okay. when, so Craig, when Craig when Craig started, he was 38, right? Was yeah, it? I mean, you know, it, again, it depends on what they want to do with the character. My my gut tells me yeah. that they might go younger just from pressure uh, yeah. from the studios. But, um, you know, one thing I've learned about the Bond family, the, the broccoli daughter and stepbrother, is they don't bow to pressure. I mean, they really want to make sure they get it right. You know, Which they kind of have for the most part. But like Daniel Craig's going to be a tough act to follow because he – he brought humor. He brought humanity. Now, I should say that I have seen No Time to Die. Bastard. <laughs> yep. What? But you didn't tell I'd us? Like think, I'd like to think that during this interview, I, I played my hand well with the audience, that, that I didn't let my bias for what the outcome you know come through. I will say that this will be a film that people will want to talk about. I hope that during the pandemic, people feel safe to go to the movies and whatever they need to do, because I'm glad I saw it in the movie theater. But Craig said from the beginning that, you know, I'm going to do one final film. And usually that never happens. Usually like with Pierce Brosnan or, or Dalton, something happens and they just move on. Or in the case of Roger Moore, he just was like, got too old. And it was clear he couldn't (laughs) do it. But he never said, this is my last film of you to a kill. It was more of like, kind of, you know, and Connery just said, I want out. This is my last movie. But then he came back. So this for me feels the first time we actually got The actor on board with, you know, saying, I want it to be my last film. We're going to promote it as my last film. And it really is an end to an incredible era. Well, John, let me ask you this. Having seen the last film, how would you rate Craig and the Pantheon of Bonds? Well, by the time this episode airs, the film will be open in wide release. It'll have opened in the States. And a lot of people who anybody who listens to the show probably will have seen it. So um, my opinion doesn't really mean much. But since you asked, I'd say that he's he's up there, but he's also living in, in a time where films expect more from storytelling and from acting. So while I can say he may be the best Bond, he was also able Ooh. and willing to do things that wasn't asked. I mean, you know, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, they cast a guy who didn't have any acting experience, and he had to do the most acting of any of the Bond films up to that point. Connery didn't have to you know, fall in love. Connery didn't have to, you know, get married and have his bride die in his arms in the final frame. Everybody thought like, God, if only Connery had hung around for that last film. But who knows? Maybe it wasn't something he would have been comfortable doing. Roger Moore had one film where he was kind of believable and serious. And Dalton, I think, was pretty consistent. And the second one was actually one of the most, up to that point, heartfelt and brutal of the series. I'm, I'm not really answering your question. I think Daniel Craig has been a great Bond. I think that he's also a very good actor. And I think he did the right thing ending when he did. As Hugh Jackman said, with Logan having spoken to Jerry Seinfeld, you want to leave with a little gas left in the tank. Mm-hmm. You want the audience maybe not sick of you yet. You want to go yeah. out where, and you also want to be in an age where you can still work. You want to go on the top. Yeah, I get you that. don't want to be just typecast. I think Pierce Brosnan will look back at that rejection by the Broccoli's as a good thing because he did go on and do Mama Mia. Interesting. He did Mama Mia. <laughs> he did the, the, the Matador is a great Damn. movie. Damn. 
Mama Mia, here we go again. <laughs> Ford, how about this? Will it make it any easier if we remove Sean Connery from the remain? Remaining actors. Connery is, you know, the proto Bond, and it was, and and you know, someone in the Bond community, you know, there's always asked, "What's your favorite Bond?" And someone said, "It's Doctor No," because everybody involved had no idea it was going to be this cultural phenomenon. They were just making a spy movie, and they cast an unknown. And yes, there was some anticipation because the novels. But no, it was kind of like the first season of Survivor or American Idol. Nobody knew it was going to be this big juggernaut, highly scrutinized, everybody's going to want to be a part of. It was just one movie, and Connery was just playing a role. And so there's a specialness to kind of being first, kind of like, you know, the cast of Star Trek, yeah. you know, or any other or any other show that you were the first one to play that role. You didn't know it was going to be successful. You were just hoping to do well. And so Connery, to me, you know, gets that. But the films are problematic, just like a lot of the Moors, but that's more of the times. You know, I don't, I don't blame the actors for just doing what was asked of them. That was a job. And I think we've been lucky in a lot of these franchises to get people that, that did stick around a while, like Hugh Jackman and others, but they really cared about the character and were good to the fans and really respected the franchise. It wasn't just a paycheck. And I think that's kind of what I really like about Daniel Craig is, I'm sure he had his demands about what he wanted the character to be, but he seemed like he really committed as an actor. This wasn't just like with Roger Moore, like, well, I've got another yacht, so I'll do Octopussy. You know, he really, and I like Roger Moore, but I think Daniel Craig really brought an actor's ethic to it that I would like to see in the next one. Okay. All right. We'll 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 wrap this up, but um, what are your predictions for the movie? Uh, I predict that, uh, we will have a definite ending, and I anticipate something unexpected happening to the character, i.e., and again, I have not seen the movie, but I'm expecting James Bond to get killed. Doc? Damn. Yeah, I think there will definitely be an ending to his arc. Um, I'm hoping he doesn't get killed. Who knows? Uh, but I really haven't put that much thought into it, you know, because I just want to go in there and just enjoy it. Kind of get a feeling we'll get another double O agent out of it, but uh, yeah. that's uh, that's pretty much it. You know, I just want to go. I'll be seeing in, seeing the movie in about a week. I just want to go and enjoy it. And uh, yeah, at that point, I'll be able to decide who I feel is my favorite Bond or where Daniel Craig falls on the list. Well, I highly encourage everybody to go see it. Safety protocols and all that. I think it's worth the wait. It's definitely going to be one to talk about. And, um, you know, maybe we'll do we'll revisit this topic at another time, maybe with a different actor. We shall see. Well, thank you to our listeners, both Bond fans and non-Bond fans, both openly geeky and closeted geeky, for joining us on this expanded universe 007 journey. This has been John H.H., and with me as always is... This is Doc. And S'more. And remember that this is your safe space to talk about all things geeky and where you can get your geek on. Geek out! out! Thank you for geeking out with us on the Expanded Universe. If you're enjoying all this geeky, nerdy pop culture stuff, make sure you've subscribed to our show, which is part of the Cinema Craptaculous channel. Available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and more. And while you're there, rate us and write us a review. It helps us get the craptaculous word out. Once you've subscribed, you get all of our weekly shows, which includes B-Sides with Adam, Dave, and Tara. Terror Tunnel with Stephanie and her horror co-hosts, The Expanded Universe with the Geeks, John H.H., Doc, and S'more, Real Debates with Dave, Adam, J.D.H., and some surprise guests, and, of course, our flagship Cinema Craptaculous with Dave, John, and Stephanie. And you can find more fun content at cinemacraptaculous.com and follow us on social media. We're Cinema Craptaculous on Facebook, and on Twitter and Instagram, we're at Craptaculous. So much Craptaculous stuff for you to savor and enjoy. Can you really savor Craptaculous? Yes. Yes, you can.